Good afternoon, everyone. I am Hadia Badri, Senior Adult Learning Coordinator at the Department of Learning and Research. And on behalf of Sharjah Art Foundation, I would like to welcome you to the first International Biennale Association stage in front of a live audience to discuss the ongoing edition of Sharjah Biennale 15. We are joined by Hur al Qasimi, President of the International Biennale Association and President and Director of Sharjah Art Foundation, who will discuss her vision in developing Sharjah Biennale 15, thinking historically in the present, and her collaboration with the late Okuye Nuzor. She is joined in this session by Octavio Zaya, independent curator and art writer who was part of the Sharjah Biennale 15 working group, as well as artist Maria Magdalena, Magdalena Campos Pons, whose works are featured in the Biennale. The session is moderated by Christian Oxenius. It's a great pleasure to be able to welcome our speakers, the live audience here with us in Sharjah and everyone joining us online via Zoom. We would like to extend our gratitude to IBA for their support towards this edition of March Meeting, which starts tomorrow and convenes under the banner of the post-colonial constellation, Art, Culture, Politics after 1960. Thank you for joining us here today. I will now hand it over to Christian. Thank you for the introduction and uh, thank you all for, for being here today. Um, as, as just mentioned, this is the first time that we have <coughs> our IBA stage uh, in front of a live audience and I think it's a, it's a great honor and uh, it's exciting to try uh, a different take on uh, a project uh, and a series of, uh, of events that was started about two and a half years ago in the middle of the pandemic as a way of allowing um, the broader public to experience some of the biennials that they could not experience because of the travel uh, limitations. <coughs> and uh, it has continued since inviting, uh, right now I think over 10 plus biennials to present their, their more recent project. And uh, it's slowly also building an archive uh, of biennials uh, narrated by biennial makers, which is, uh, was very interesting to, to follow uh, throughout throughout the program. Uh, for those that know a little less about the International Biennial Association, uh, IBA was uh, founded uh, about a decade ago in uh, uh, 2014 in Berlin. And uh, I'm glad to have with me on stage uh, Hura Kasimi, who is not only our current president, was, uh, but was also one of the founding members at the time. Um, IBA works uh, uh, broadly to promote uh, the biennial model uh, of exhibition making, uh, but more importantly, it's a space to uh, discuss relevant topics such as sustainability of the model, uh, uh, cooperation and co-productions between biennials, <coughs> and uh, uh, is now representing over 100 biennials across five continents. Uh, we're working continuously to expand our uh, range of uh, both public programming and uh, discussions that we have uh, between, between institutions. And you can find more information about us at uh, uh, biennialassociation.org. You're more than welcome to reach out uh, for, for any questions. Uh, before opening the discussion, I just want to run through a few uh, house rules for those following us over Zoom, uh, because the event is, as always, uh, uh, also streamed um, <coughs> live through our Zoom and through our social media uh, channels. So, <coughs> first of all, I want to remind everyone that uh, the event is recorded uh, and will be used, uh, uh, f will be, yeah, basically used further along for, for archival purposes and it will be available on our website and on our YouTube channel. Uh, if you wish to uh, comment or make questions uh, from afar, uh, you can use the chat function. Uh, your microphone and uh, camera are uh, automatically switched off for this event in particular. 
uh, but please make sure that they are uh, so you don't interfere with, uh, with our discussion here. And uh, again, if you have any questions, reach out to us at info at Thank you for uh, uh, the time that I spent doing this. Um, <clears throat> Since we got already like a brief introduction of all our speakers, I would like to uh, jump directly into um, a first question. And I also have to say that usually IBA stage uh, functions a bit as a presentation of the biennial with a PowerPoint or a slideshow or whatever. Uh, given the fact that we're all here in Sharjah and that most of you will have the possibility of uh, actually seeing the biennial firsthand, uh, we decided to have this more as a discursive uh, uh, event to discuss the, the process behind the biennial and some of the main topics that, that emerge from it. Um, I'll jump right in. And uh, uh, I will start with a very general question to open the discussion. Uh, because the biennial feels like uh, a culmination of a long trajectory uh, from, well, started by Hur in 2002, <laughs> uh, during, uh, during, Documenta, during Documenta 11, uh, of course curated by, by Okwi. Um, but I think over the years, uh, the, over the years and over the last few years, the project also changed, of course, and, and it became your own project. And, and uh, we will hear a bit from you, of course, how, how this uh, how this developed. But I would like to hear, because also uh, Maria Magdalena and, and Octavio have, ha have had uh, uh, the pleasure to work with, with Okwi uh, in the past, uh, what you found of, uh, of, his, uh, uh, of his legacy, but also what you find as, uh, as, a, new, uh, as a new element, let's say, as a new element. Thank you, Christian. Thank you all for being here. So um, I'm very happy to be able to host IBA stage here in Sharjah in person. Uh, as Christian mentioned, the International Biennial Association, we are trying to come together as biennials to collaborate rather than compete, to co-produce rather than push artists to overproduce works and not be able to uh, have the funds to do something. Um, so it's all about collaborations and learning from each other and supporting each other when things go wrong, as you know, all biennials, things always go wrong. So it's, uh, it's good to have this network, you know, it's a, uh, of, of colleagues and friends. Um, so um, in saying that, with Sharjah Biennial, we have many, many partners who help make this biennial possible, and I have to mention that and thank everyone. Uh, we've had many partners who've supported uh, a lot of the commissions, a lot of the works, even works that were not commissions. So this biennial has been a, a great effort, not just locally and regionally, but internationally. Um, so we're very grateful for that, including IBA partnering on the March meeting. Uh, coming back to the biennial, um, it is a long trajectory. I think when, when I've been asked, uh, how long did it take you to curate this, to work on this biennial? I'd say four years, technically, but actually 20 years. So um, it's really gone back to why I came and I would say hijacked Sharjah Biennial in 2002 and why I wanted to change things and what I felt visiting Documenta 11 and what that meant to me as an artist and a visitor. Um, and I feel you know, when I approached Okui, it was 2018. Um, I was in Dakar Biennial. I was with Salah at the conference of the Dakar Biennial, and I was sending him a WhatsApp message across the theater. And I said, I'm thinking of the next Biennial, 15, and I can't get Okwi out of my mind. Do you think he'll be interested? I said, why don't you just ask him? So, you know, that really was the start for me. Um, I work, uh, people who know me, I work a lot with instinct. <laughs> if I feel something, I trust my gut and I go with it. Um, and I was very happy that Okwi was receptive. He was very much a supporter of Sharjah Biennial. Whenever we faced any issue, uh, he was there. Uh, other trials and tribulations, he was always supportive. Um, and that means a lot for us as a, a biennial in our part of the world that doesn't really have a lot of um, support from the West. We're always looked at critically in the view of, they just see what they want to see. It doesn't matter. They don't have to understand what's happening here. So that really meant a lot that we, that people like Okwi had our back. So 
um, I knew that I could I could count um, on him. Um, of course, he he wasn't well, and I really wanted to know what I, I was supposed to do with this biennial. And he said, well, "You do it." So I automatically thought, oh, "Okay, I have to do his exhibition, and I had to find out what." But it's, I'm not here to second guess what somebody would do. But I automatically wanted to reach out to people who could help me figure it out. So I was grateful for the working group: uh, Octavia Zaya, Salah Hassan, Chika Okeke, uh, Uta Meta Bauer, and Tara Abul Futuh. And of course, uh, I also reached out to uh, some um, advisory members, uh, Christine Tome, David Ajay. So people who really said, you know, we're here for you. You know, whatever you need, we're here. Um, and then the pandemic hit, so that was another thing that happened. Uh, but it really made us think about what we were supposed to do. And I think deciding that this is a homage to Oakley. You know, it's not about me or us doing Okwi's show. This is about everything we've learned. You know, he's uh, um, been an inspiration to many people and we're still learning so much about um, what, what he's done. But, um, and I also really wanted to invite artists who he worked with closely, artists who I've worked with closely, and some we've both worked with, and some we've never worked with. So that, it, it's a little bit of a, of a, of a new situation, I guess, but, I think his, his keywords, his uh, message is strong in every single artist's work. The ones who knew him or, or I would say knew him or he knew or didn't know as well. But anyway, I'm gonna pass it on to uh, Magda. <clears throat> Good afternoon and thank you to the foundation and thank you to Eva and uh, my colleagues here in the stage. And before I say anything, I'm going to ask for permission to the ancestors who put me in the path in which Oquim Hueso was as well. Also, as we celebrate this um, incredible moment in the history of the Charger Biennial, uh, it would coincide with the fourth anniversary of his passing this March 15. So to his memory, uh, my gratitude and to forever present uh, my gratitude and understanding. I was privileged enough uh, to meet Okwi, I would say very early in my career. In 1994, I came to America in 1991. In 1994, I happened to make a piece that um, uh, Salah Hassan, he and another were wanted very badly in the cover of NK magazine. And, and I was thinking that I cannot do that because I was showing my breast and milk and whatever, and I was very embarrassed. But it was the beginning of a very important uh, relation and very important uh, conversation uh, with somebody at that moment is still very young, but he has a keen eye to issues that were pertinent to me. I was invited to Trey Roots 1997 in Johannesburg, and this small session was called Little Necess Life, Little Necessities. And I was um, in Seville Benale, and very early on, uh, privileged again, we see writing one of the largest and most beautiful essays that I say, introduce my work and presented the work uh, to, to the world in some way, when in 2007, have the chance to be with him in the Dakar Biennale in 2004. So this is uh, 2001, Venice in the African Forum. Uh, very important uh, uh, moment of engagement and uh, a clarifying, a clarifying moment of about what was this journey that us artists of the black diaspora were trying to take in the context of us working in what we then call the, the archipelago. Uh, of the African uh, in a diasporic uh, move. So I, I think um, in the experience of being in Sharjah and participating in revisiting concepts that he put in there, but he couldn't finish, uh, I want to say how um, amazing has been to walk this journey in the making of the city anniversary of the Sharjah 
biennial and working very close uh, with Hur in this project, but also having him uh, present and, and also kind of, kind of piggyback in the bag that he so easily uh, prepared for many of us uh, to, move, to move forward. Um, I don't know if that is a good uh, introduction to just to say how I feel as an artist uh, of the diaspora, as an, uh, an artist of an African origin, but I want to mention something else as we are at the same time conversing about DEVA and this, in the International uh, Biennial Association. I was a student in 1984 in the city of Havana, the Hager Institute of Art, when in Havana was launched the Havana Biennale. The Havana Biennale, uh, very early on, in some way, create the platform that would be uh, the launching pad for many of the scenes that we discuss today in the world. It was a biennial who looked deeply into everything that was outside the West. It was a biennial that put together forgotten places, no seeing places in the scourge of visuality in contemporary time. And it reunited almost all makers around this so-called a third world country. It was the no aligned movement. It was a very political biennial. It was actually a Castro move, but it was one of his good move. It was one of the, this vision about culture and art could be a very important tool for solidarity and, and for bringing together voices that matter in contemporary discourse in whatever way that that was seen and really open opportunities that were, until today, quite transformative. Uh, I was very young, I was still in, in college, but it was an absolutely moment of awakening and transformation. The artists that I met then, until this day, some of them are still my friends and the people that I follow and I admire. Uh, and it really not only changed opportunity for Cubans, but everyone that was part of that so-called no aligned movement that I always say it was everything outside the NATO of outside the group of seven. So it was the rest of the world. And that was very important. Oki went to Cuba and saw the Havana Biennale uh, with Octavio, uh, which we'll talk about it, uh, and, and Newted as well. Uh, and that was um, a very important um, point of departure that is still um, impactful. Uh, at this moment as we uh, have come this amazing, beautiful, circular way from uh, early 90s to 2023. So I, I think that I would stop there and come back if needed. Can you hear me? Uh, thank you so much for being here, particularly thank uh, IBA, and also uh, especially Hur al Kasimi and Sarja for bringing me here once again. It's my first time completely directly involved uh, with the biennial as a curator, helping with Uche Metabauer, with the group of uh, working group that uh, Hur already mentioned. Um, I was before here. Uh, invited by Yuko Hasegawa when she was curating the biennial. And later on, I participated as a jury for the prize, uh, for the Sarja Prize. Uh, so my relationship with Sarja have been uh, not only uh, started when, when who took over in a way uh, the directorship of the, of the biennial uh, since 2002, I believe, uh, but even before, because for me, uh, Sharja uh, was in the constellation of biennials that, as Magda says correctly, uh, uh, followed the footprint of a Bada biennial. And I will include there Johannesburg Biennial, Istanbul Biennial, and many other biennials that Get, get away with from, from the national pavilions and national representation and I started to look at artists from a different perspective that it wasn't followed by a linear reading of, of art and, and, and not her, uh, hierarchical and start understanding 
the necessity of bringing the South uh, and, and other continents other than North America and Europe into the, the fore. Uh, Havana was very important and it was, it was for me a very important uh, biennial because in a way it started to form in my intellectual thoughts of the time uh, the ideas that later were developed particularly uh, uh, with the help and collaboration with Oakley and Weiser. But uh, Havana was also important because uh, it brought for the first time, as Magda said, uh, Africa, Asia, and Latin America into the main uh, protagonistic uh, field of the of the of an international biennial. Uh, with the perspective of, of the time, uh, I would say, and after the big knowledge that I that I uh, had from colleagues and friends in the art world. I could say that Habana is still a very, very important uh, example, historically, I would say, from thinking historically in the present, uh, is a very important example of what, of the watershed that it meant uh, the intervention of curators, Cuban curators particularly, including Mosquera, Gerardo Mosquera, um, so on, into the field of contemporary art and how it drastically changed what we understand today as contemporary art. I have the privilege of, of meeting Okui in 94, just as colleague because she was, he, he just had published Enka, that it was the number zero of the, of the magazine that he's founded with Salah Hassan and Olu Ogive. Um, it was the first meeting that we have in Soho in New York. Um, we exchange uh, ideas um, um, and concepts related to what we understood then to be contemporary uh, art. This was 94. I was at the time co-director of the magazine Atlantica that it was published by Centro Atlantico of Modern Art in Canary Islands. Um, in that capacity of a Spanish curator, even though living in New York, I, I participated in the first Johannesburg Biennial representing Spain. I have a lot of trouble at the time because not only I selected four Spanish artists, but also 18 South African photographers. And that's how I came to meet Okwi. He realized that I was uh, probably the only curator of the time that was interested in African photographers, and he joined me, and actually I invited him, the, the Diane Wallman from the Guggenheim Museum, asked me to curate uh, a show of African photographers, actually it was about African artists at the beginning, for the Guggenheim uh, in 96. Um, I invited Okui, and it was funny, because in a meeting with Diane Wallman, I said, I will only do the show or participate in the show if we have an African curator. And Daya Wallman said, but we don't know at the Guggenheim any African curators. There is such a thing as an African curator? And I said, of course there is African curators. But at the time, we weren't paying really attention to Africa in the West, I meant. Uh, we weren't really pay paying any attention to Latin America. I was a correspondent for five different uh, media in Spain, in New York, uh, media from Spain in New York. And I quit my job to start curating African and Latin American artists in New York because I realized that nowhere, no institution was showing the amount of work that I have seen produced all over Latin America and Africa. And that was for me a very important decision. And again, that's how I met Okwi. That's how we did our first show together. That it was uh, uh, Inside African Photographers 1940 to the present. It was so successful 
that he was appointed director of the second Johannesburg Biennial. By the time he, do, he did without national pavilions of the first Johannesburg Biennial, and we did together the main show in Johannesburg in the electric workshop that it was called alter, Alternating Currents. Alternating Currents was an idea that I, that I brought from Octavio Paz, the Mexican poet, that he has a, a, a very important uh, book that it was called Corrientes Alternas. That is precisely what it means, uh, Alternating Currents. And it was a very important show from which we learned, both of us, um, the curators that participated in that biennial, including Yu Yang Ki, Juan Ru, Gerardo Mosquera, and also uh, Kelly Jones that did the show in Cape Town with Magda and so many other artists that are today in Johannesburg, in Sharjah Biennial. So that was a, a very important event also that brought me together with Okri. But the most important event of my career to date was Documenta 11 that we did with an incredible roster of today, I, I could call them celebrities, from Sarad Maharaj to Mark Nash, Ute Meta Bauer, Susan Guest, Carlos Basualdo. It was an amazing learning process. Since then, I would say, well, after this, what else I could do? Because for us, I'm still learning from Documenta 11, and this is already 20 years later. But I'm still learning because we did so much that we, at the time, couldn't figure exactly how to place or understand in the historical moment that we were living. Uh, we published eight books, and I'm still reading those books, like Creolization and Creolite. It is a book that for me keep on being now, today. And um, that's why as soon as uh, who asked me to form, to be a part of the working uh, team, I said immediately yes, because not only I understood this to be a homage to Okwi, but I knew also that Documenta 11 was a, a very important event in the, in the career and the life of Hur. And also, I knew that together with the team that she put together, we were going to do something really special. I'm extremely proud to be here, and I'm very, very happy that who uh, invited me here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Octavio, and thank you, Hur and Magda, for your uh, contribution to the question. Um, I want to try to bring the discussion closer to uh, Sharjah Banyal 15. Um, and maybe I would like to point to something that uh, especially Magda and, and Octavio um, discussed, which is uh, the role of the Havana Biennial, uh, which definitely was the first major biennial in which uh, the non-aligned uh, countries and the, the, this idea of the third world was, was um, uh, theorized and, and represented in, in a biennial. Uh, however, I do see, of course, and it's 40 years ago, so of course we thought a lot and, and discussed a lot since then, uh, there is a, a, a substantial change, I think, uh, between then and now. Uh, and uh, I think you can, you can summarize it uh, with this idea of uh, really moving non-hierarchically uh, throughout the world. Um, and I think this is something that is very evident here in Sharjah, not just in the selection of artists and of works that you, that you made, Hur, but also in the way that you treated the venues, the whole uh, of the territory of Sharjah. And uh, in this regard in particular, I would like to, to ask you how you went about it. Uh, because as we were also discussing off stage earlier, I do see uh, a strange parallel or a evident parallel um, between treating a territory as you did, uh, in which there is no hierarchy between Sharjah, Kalba, uh, Korfakan, and, uh, and the other venues, 
to an idea of the world and the art world uh, that is behind the, the whole exhibition. Uh, so really questioning uh, an idea of center and an idea of uh, uh, hierarchical centers, let's say. Thanks, Christian. Well, um, a lot of the artists here know that I'm very obsessed with the space. I'm very picky with the space. Um, um, I'm, so because I'm from here, I know this place. It means a lot to me. Every building that we've saved means a lot to me. Every new building we've built means a lot to me. So sometimes when you're not curating, you have to let go, but you don't have to like everything. So this was my chance to use the spaces the way I wanted to use them finally, so I was very happy. Um, and I worked very closely with every single artist to figure out what is the best space for the work and what is the best work for the space. And I think that is really important. In terms of decentering um, the biennial from this main city of Sharjah, so we always grew up with an event in the city and then something small in one of the other towns and cities of Sharjah. And I thought that was very unfair because that was very uneven, you know. Why, why is this place more important than that place? Why um, are we choosing to allow visitors just to come one place and then just leave? What about the people that live in those places? It's also a trek for them to come. So growing up, I always thought about this and I also reached out to many venues and buildings that were also either about to be demolished or would be potentially demolished. Um, so I started saving a lot of these buildings. Um, the ice factory, which is actually a fish feed factory, so you know, for all the historians here who keep wanting to correct me, i.e. my father, <laughs> it, is, <laughs> it is a uh, fish feed factory that was, wasn't used as a fish feed factory uh, fishermen stored ice, and the locals called it the ice factory. So it's called the ice factory, even though it's not technically the ice factory. Um, but this is, you know, with the arts, you can, you can um, dream. So um, the ice factory we used, um, and also this is the thing, so in the first biennial, um, when I had the factory, Yuko Hasegawa was the curator, and she said, oh, no, no, it's too far, health and safety, I don't even want to use this building, I don't even know what it is. So the next biennial, Unji, Ju, I said, please, Unji, I really want to use it. Even though we were already planning a renovation, I said, I'm willing to postpone the renovation because um, I really want to use it as is, as a shell, as a factory. And Adrian Villarocha was going to use it, and I knew he would do something special. And I remember um, Engineer Hassan saying, well, you know, prices are going to go up in Expo 2020 and then the World Cup. And the, I said, doesn't matter, we are not we'll rethink the whole thing, let's just not use it, not, not renovate it. And then um, the biennial after that, we opened the space in Hamriya, which, is, uh, which you saw on the first day, I think, when you arrived. Um, and that's another story, but that was in the next biennial. And again, Christine thought, Christine Tome was the curator. I said, I can't do both West Coast and East Coast. <laughs> so I thought, okay, next biennial, three curators. Nobody's gonna give me the excuse that I can't be everywhere. So, <laughs> so, and I again postponed the renovation by another year. So you're seeing the renovation of the ice factory. And those of you who haven't, you'll see it at the end of the, of the week. Um, but it was really special that everything is used slowly. Everything is, we take our time. If something happens, it's fine. Uh, if we, we just, it just means we have to spend time with it and take longer thinking about it. And we've, we actually changed architects, we rethought everything we wanted to do. Um, and by the time we actually renovated the factory, the city around us had actually developed as well. So it was kind of time for us to be renovated in a way. So that's kind of one idea. And another, I'll just give one more example, is the clinic in al -Daid. This is an example of where the local um, clinic, the preventative clinic, they reached out to me and said, we need to move to a new building but we want you to take our building because we know you won't demolish it. So I said, okay, I don't have the funds or the manpower right now, woman power right now, but I'll happily wait uh, until you're ready to move out. <laughs> and then we, um, and then COVID hit. So we were doing site visits while they were doing COVID tests. And then another section, which you'll see at the back says malaria section. So it was a bit of an adventure, I have to say, with this dead farm and, uh, next to a cemetery and 
other thing. But th this is really important. It's all part of the process. So I think I'm going to stop there. Oh, wait, wait, one more thing. Wait. And then the idea of artists, again, you know, I didn't, I, I go to a lot of biennials, of course, with my job and IBA, and I'm there to support, with, support each other. But I always find that people always say something is too far. And that's really frustrating for me. Or I remember in one Istanbul biennial, someone said, oh, I went all the way and it was just one artist's work. So that's always, again, very frustrating. And, and then the artists don't want to do that because they think their work is not going to be seen. So it was important for me that each town or location had an exhibition. It wasn't about just one person here, one person there. So you, in a way, they're kind of exhibitions or biennials in their own right. But together, they also come together to create something different. There is no start or end to the biennial. It doesn't matter where you start, even within the root of the exhibition. Uh, I think you create your own narrative. There is a connection, whichever way you walk. So, um, And I'm interested to hear how everybody's experienced it in their own way as well. I want to pick up from something that you said. Yeah. To, uh, to Pass actually the discussion to, to Octavio. Sorry, Michael, I just saw that you were uh, turning on your mic. But I, I wanted to take what you mentioned right now, uh, especially the last bit uh, about um, yeah this perceived hierarchy also from the artists, but also from the visitors, um, and try to build a parallel between this mentality and that of a Western slash global uh, perspective on the uh, on the art world in general uh, because I think as you as you said um, this idea that oh yeah that's that venue is too far or or it's not worth going all the way to Calba just to see five artists is very similar I think uh, ideologically and 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 uh, as a mentality to how the West was producing uh, a global art picture until the 80s with, with the Havana Biennial, and, but it continued afterwards, you know. Um, so I wanted to hear from, from Octavio, but also from Nagda, of course, if you want to intervene, um, how also this connects uh, with, uh, with the idea not just of geographically, uh, a geographically interconnected world, but also a historically interconnected world. No? So how, how the histories of the West and, and of other geographies are, are coming together and, and how one is defining the other, let's say, or how the West has been using that to define. Its I own. think that Magda should address this question. Absolutely, go ahead. <laughs> no, because of an important reason. She decentralized Havana Biennial. She created Havana Biennial in Matanzas, that is kilometers away from, from Havana, and she created an international uh, biennial two years ago in which I have uh, the honor to participate also. And I think that she should uh, address this. Absolutely. Because she has the play, incredible experience of dealing, in dealing with the buro uh, Cuban bureaucracy and so on. <laughs> Absolutely. I am not going to discuss the difficulty <laughs> of, wor of working with Cuban bureaucracy. But what I want to emphasize, and, I, and thank you, Octavio, for that shut up. But what I want to, to emphasize in one uh, aspect, in a different way, Christian, and I come back to your question. Uh, in thinking historically in the present, as an artist, as a maker, I, I want to come back as well to the legacy of Okui. And he's a, he, he, he helping to give us permission to be who we are and not trying to please any other expectation of where we come from. Doing so doesn't come with our price or pain, but what he helped as a thinker, as a, a, a maker of concepts and ideas, aesthetic points, was literally allowed us to walk a path that was no transit yet, uh, aesthetic. What is the aesthetic of the Caribbean? What it means to be a contemporary practitioner in a place in which you need to deal with scarcity, necessity, and leftover sins? Um, what it means really to construct a contemporary discourse out of nothing, 
of, out of nothingness. That is Cuba. That is in many other places in the third world. And that was a discourse for a long time was misunderstood or literally put aside in the West over and over and over, even during Oqui uh, present. A complex thing, but he, he literally passed the way for the kind of conversation that taking place right now in Sharjah and for the kind of displays and extraordinary opening of possibility of beauty, of possibility of restorative work and restorative art, which is something else. Uh, I say as, as, um, about my own self, when I was invited to exhibit in 1998 in MoMA, which they did, they exhibited me, but many times I was told, we don't know what to do with you. But Okwi knew what to do with me. And he also knew how to explain what I was doing, precisely. Not only for others, but for me finding clarity. That is important. And when I am thinking, in, after seeing and being in charge for weeks, installing my work and participating with my other colleagues here, how amazing and how wonderful the thread of continuity and circularity from his vision and his hand to the work that Hood is doing now here and that we all are participating. Yes, Matanzas is one part of that permission too, that in some way I learned with uh, Okwi and his team and the people that were around him at the same time. Matanzas was when artists dare to share authority and to, and to, ch and to challenge uh, the status quo. I started Matanzas because I was invited to Havana and I was in a moment of discontent with what Havana was doing. And I say, I am not interested to exhibit right now in Havana. I'm going to start what I see as a point of necessity and urgency, a word that comes from Nokwi, literary urgency in Matanzas. And it become this incredible new spot of ideas and possibilities. So for me, uh, it's, it's very important too, when we think historically and to the present, the complexities and the, and the complications, and I want to maybe differentiate complexity and complications, that mean to be a artist, curator, or maker in the diaspora, and in the center of a conversation that had been so, for so long, uh, hold and control by the, by the West as a center of power. It's beautiful to be in charge. It's, re it's re restorative and encouraging to be in charge and see the power and the impact that the work being made here has, but not only in the point of aesthetic implication as historically we have seen, no, what is doing for this city? What is doing for this geography? What is doing for the bodies that transit in this geography? This is what made me so uh, uh, exciting. I know there to say optimistic, because I am in fear of optimism at this moment, but feel that yes, a future is there that we are already defining. And for me, the horizontality that we were talking before is that I am an artist, who was an artist, or is still an artist, <laughs> and we are creating, but we are creating in this new path for where new language is needed to be formed, and that off we left us some good holding point and some very good guiding lines so we could work through it. It's the most transformative scene that has happened in the end of the 20th century. I participate in Documenta 14. Adam Shinshink speak over and over and over how Okwi was his role model, how Okwi was the mirror in what he wanted to reflect himself. Uh, and I think that Documenta 15 it's another, we could say that it's coming from an umbilical core that Okwi left for all of us to continue. No one has been in the question of curatoria and dealing and to challenge the status quo of, in art, um, or the language, in, in fact, and the concept, and the idea of what defines art. Because what is beautiful is that we are still searching, and he opened that door. What is art? What is the materiality of memory? What is the materiality of sentiment? 
What is the materiality of being, as I used to say, and pardon me anybody, corny. I am a Caribbean woman. I am a Latin American woman. I am corny sometimes. Do that have any space in art? Yes, it does. And the first person that let it allow me to believe that was Oku and Weso. How could I be romantic or sentimental or melodramatic being? How could I bring the history of my home to the center of discourse in visuality without being a reason to say this don't belong here? He opened the way for belonging, for entering, to participate, for permission, for yes, your aesthetic or ricky tracky, broken, unfinished, is beautiful and it has a space within us. And it's no Arte Povera, it's something else. It's something else that was there way before Arte Povera was defined as such. So it's not that. Don't give me that term because it doesn't fit it. We need to find new language. That's what I think. I would like to clarify one thing uh, for those that are listening. Uh, there is the fact that we cannot read the past or cannot think the past or history uh, in a fetishized way. Like, we have to understand, as Angela Davis said in the interview with Mancia de Aguara, is that it's, it's nice to look back, it's nice to, to be proud of, but the most important thing is that we cannot forget the struggle, what it meant to be here now. That's why we have to uh, think historically in the present. That's exactly what it means. It doesn't mean fetishizing uh, all uh, we have done. Um, it's what Magda said. Everything that she has uh, said point to that, to that direction. It's very important to understand that every, we, we, everything we have done, it have taken a lot of struggle and a lot of problems. Angela Davis said, said it very succinctly. Racism have taken five centuries no five years, we are not dealing with a subject that is only present. It has the reality of five full centuries. And that is the, the perspective that from, from my point of view, we have to have very clear every time that we approach, like we approach Sarja. Coming back to Sarja, uh, if you look at the art from a perspective that is just national, that is genderized, that is you are missing a lot. You have to understand it in historical terms. And historical terms means that you have to deal with the crimes of the British Empire, of the Spanish Empire, of all the things you have to take in account. It's not just, oh, look how, how rich we are now. Or, look what, what, what we have done. Uh, no, we have to actually set everything historically and understand who we are in the historical sense. And that's what uh, basically uh, Magda is saying, we, he, he, in other words. And Okwi help us understand these issues. Uh, and we have to fight. And constantly we have to confront uh, uh, powers that didn't allow us to express ourselves. And that is why it was so important not only for him, but for all of us that collaborated with him, the issue of access. We, it's not that we allowed, we enter into that house that was forbidden for us for so long, or that didn't allow us to express the way we want to express. And that's why Magda uh, clearly said, this is no Arte Povera, this is no minimalism, this is no uh, uh, Mandarin minimalism. This is the life and struggle of so many people that without access, without anything, brought us here. And that's who we are. And that's how we have to look at places like Sharjah, the exhibition that uh, 
uh, who have been putting together. And you have also to understand one thing. This is no Oquis exhibition. This is Hur exhibition. This is Hur that brought together a lot of people and learn as we keep on learning every day by the experience of others, uh, learn how to deal with these issues and, and brought people to express themselves in fullness and uh, openly in relation to the issues we are confronting in the world at the present time. But we cannot understand, let me repeat it again, this present time if we cover up everything in a pretty picture. We have to understand the present through the struggle, the pain, and the joys of uh, the life that we have been going through uh, for the last 20 centuries. Thank you, Magda. Uh, thank you, Octavio. Thank you, Hur. <coughs> uh, in line with our tradition in IBA stage. Uh, we'd like to keep uh, a few minutes at the end to open up the questions uh, uh, to the audience here, but also to the audience that is following us through Zoom. Uh, for those following us through Zoom, you can write in the chat. For anyone in the audience, I'd like you to raise your hand if you want to contribute or if you have questions to, um, to the discussion. You will receive a mic so that people over Zoom can follow you. Thank you. Uh, my question is for Hoor. Thinking historically in the present, how did you come up with that idea? What does it mean for you? And how is it manifest in the show for you? I, I have to say that was, uh, I was very grateful for Okui's title, Thinking Historically in the Present. He mentioned it when he gave a talk here at the March meeting um, in 2005. Um, and it's something that has been in his practice uh, for the longest period. I think he was working on his uh, trilogy of post-war and post-colonial and post-communism. Um, and he knew that what he wanted to do with, with the exhibition in Sharjah, when he stated clearly the title, Thinking Historically in the Present. Um, he wanted us to uh, first think of Sharjah Biennial, Historically in the Present, and reflect on the last 30 years. Um, so the first March meeting we did was looking at the history of Sharjah Biennial and its to, and its influence and what has been what has influenced it in the region. Um, so we did that one during the pandemic online, and um, and to create an archive, uh, we're still working on this archive. A lot of it is needs translation. It's in Arabic as well, uh, but you see some of it within the exhibition, and we're working on a publication for that. So these were Okui's. Uh, um, requests for this biennial. Um, and another one was a list of keywords that were given to to me to use to reflect with artists. Um, and I really focused on those, looking at the different keywords that that he was thinking about with his exhibition that he wanted to do, which is the post-colonial constellation, which we'll talk about more tomorrow at the, at the start of the March meeting. Um, Coming up with a title is always very difficult. Um, sometimes it comes at the end, uh, but it was very interesting for me to have that set in stone. And it also takes back everything that I've been doing in, in Sharjah, because, um, for example, the Africa Institute that we established uh, with Salah Hassan um, in 2018, 2016, we started discussing it, also has a history from 1976. Sharjah Biennial, I didn't want to, after Documenta, create a new space. I wanted to go to something that already exists. With the buildings, <coughs> I wanted to go to something that already exists. So in everything that I've been doing, I've always wanted to work with the context of the history of the space, the project, the topic. Um, and it made me think, actually, with everything that I'm doing, it was interesting because um, I get asked a lot, so what the, what's the future of this and what's the future going to be? And I just keep saying, I'm thinking historically in the present because it, I'm 
the, uh, the daughter of a historian. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm constantly trying to reflect on how far we've come. The UAE has grown so quickly, but yet we're still trying to find out who we are and what our history is. Um, you know, we've gone through you know, Portuguese invasion, British occupation, etc., and we are within contemporary art. We are able to write our own histories and visual arts. So, um, for me, I'm v very grateful for the title uh, more than anything. Yeah. And there's an other. Because we're not used to doing this with a live audience, can you please introduce yourself as well? <laughs> Sorry. Hello, oh, that was loud, sorry. <laughs> Hi, my name is Eddie Abed. Um, I'm with a group of Australian artists visiting the Biennale. And I was wondering if um, you could speak to what's the thinking process behind um, engaging with local communities um, and local artists for the Biennale. Thank you. I'm guessing that's for me again. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, um, a lot of biennials actually just um, hire people, you know, at, at, uh, for the biennial, and then those people have to find other jobs, and then they have to hire again, and they have to train again. And for the longest period, I thought, actually, our first community is us, you know, the people that make the biennial happen. So it was really important that we grow as a community, we grow as colleagues, staff, family. Um, we're a lot of people here. Uh, that make this happen, um, but it's we've all learned over the years of working biennial to biennial, but also the exhibitions that happen throughout the uh, the year. So um, we created the Sharjah Art Foundation as a as a tool to not only um, stay together and work together, but support each other. You know, if people have to leave, they have to get another work visa, they have to go somewhere else, and. So those are the complications, but the same thing with audiences. You know, I thought, okay, we're working towards the next biennial, but you know, to the children, for example, two years is a, is a long time. So people grow up without the biennial. I have to remind people again what the biennial is or remind new people what, what we're doing. So again, engaging year round is really important. And um, we have a, a learning team, as you could see, who are organizing all the conferences and the talks, but also the workshops and programs for universities, schools, young children, etc. We do residencies as well, and we do workshops uh, where we invite also local artists to participate. We have studios for local artists, and we have uh, residencies, so there's a lot. But um, another thing that I was happy to be able to do um, taken to the umbrella of the Sharjah Art Foundation, it was under another department, are the art centers. So um, in Sharjah, there are art centers in all the little towns and cities where they teach drawing, ceramics, calligraphy, painting. Um, and I really wanted to get my hands on those. So uh, <laughs> I managed eventually, uh, because that department was dissolving in a way, and I said, that's my focus. Um, so now we have art centers in seven cities in Sharjah, and the biennial is taking place in five. So uh, in a way, you're seeing some of the work that we're doing in this, through your visits in this biennial, but there's a lot more that is, is happening uh, in these different towns, and that's really important. Which one? Oh, yeah, yes, it's true, yeah, okay. Yeah, and all the sites we create, yeah, I mean, everybody knows this. I've been uh, very vocal about it. I've created lots of little playgrounds and water fountains. Okay, so everywhere you go, you'll see these water fountains. There are just little metal boxes everywhere. Uh, we've created, we put benches, we've planted trees, we have little playgrounds. Um, it's really creating a space where people can just spend time uh, and come every day, and we've noticed that happening throughout the biennial. Um, and also, I, something that I mentioned to Michael Armitage the other day, when he did a quick visit of the biennial, it's important to not only think about creating, when you go home, it's not about creating a new building or a new space, but attach yourself to the, um, something that has a memory. You know, the, the reason we get a lot of visitors to our spaces, everybody has a memory to that space. Oh, the flying saucer, you know, I used to go there after school, blah, blah, blah. Or the Qasimiyah school, I used to, you know, that's the school I went to. So there are all these audiences that you have already because they have an attachment to the space. Um, another thing is a story that we both experienced. Um, 
during the while we were preparing for the biennial is um, I was with uh, uh, Gabrielle Goliath at her space. We were discussing the sound levels, and I could hear outside the space. Um, my name is Maria Magdalena Campos Pons, and my work is in Gallery One. I didn't know who Mag Magda was speaking to. But when I was going around to see how loud the sound was on the outside, I saw three young boys out outside the water, uh, at the water fountain. And they're but this big. And they said, are you an artist? And I said, well, no, I'm working with artists here. And, I, and they said, do you know Maria Magdalena Campos Pons? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I said, yes, I, I guess you just met her. I heard her. And they said, what's happening in there? Is it a dance concert? We want to dance. And when I was younger, a long, very, very, very long time ago, I mean, they're tiny, it's very long time ago, I came to the cinema here and I saw a film. But now the security tells me that it's closed and I can't go. I said, yeah, we open on Tuesday. Yes, Maria told us we're VVIP and we're coming. <laughs> And then I said, what do, you, what, what, what do you do here? And he said, when my father brings me to the mosque next door, and there are three little boys from Afghanistan, and, I, and everyone who knows me, we share, and you know we share our car park with the mosque, and when they have uh, the special time, our, our car park is full. I'm like, no, these people are not visiting the art, they're in the mosque. And I'm always tempted to say, bring the children in <laughs> to visit the art. So it, it was really something that, a small moment, private moment, Juwan was with me, um, but it was very, very special to me because when these moments happen, it's like 20 years later, we have um, another story of a child that says, oh, remember me, I'm the one who got up on the stage and performed after Dimi Mint Abba. And I'm like, of course we remember you, it's on YouTube. And now I'm, you know, I'm gonna be a musician. And so these are the stories that matter, I think, um, when you can create uh, well, you can see a difference, but it takes 20 years, for sure. I need to. <laughs> Could I add something just to that? Um, I call my piece in Sharjah, liminal circularities. They are two of the kid words that Oak we left uh, for, uh, who were to work with and for us, the artists. But also the second title is Family whispering or family murmur. Uh, in Spanish, I call it murmullo familiar. And it is a, a moment of reunion with our people that care for each other. As I am sitting in this stage and I am thinking of the trajectory from very early in my encounter with Okwi, it came to my mind the day that we were in Dakar, Senegal, sitting in the floor of a house, eating with the same dish, and also when he passed to me a glass with baobab tree fruit juice, and we drink from the same cup. That for me is circularity, murmullo familiar, but also pass of tradition, pass of care, Pass of healing, beauty, and an engagement that is fundamental for the work that we're doing and that is here present in Georgia. Thank you. Thank you. I think we have time for one last question. And I think there was a raised hand before. Yes, please go ahead. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, thank you so much for this conversation and this invocation also of Okwoi's presence. My name is Doreen Mende, I'm a curator and a writer and I participated in the education program of Documenta 11 in 2002 and it transformed my life. I think as for many of us sitting in that room, Documenta 11 transformed our lives thanks to Ute Meta Bauer also, and Sarat Maharaj, Carlos Basso, Aldo Octavio, and uh, thank you for, for you know, invoking that. And uh, I wanted to ask, um, I mean, I hope it's not like a too complicated question, because Documenta uh, was situated in a very specific present moment in 20, uh, 2002, and it was thinking historically in the present regarding some 
like global or planetary ruptures, I remember. Okwe was not so much referring to September 11 that just happened. I remember the conversations we had that that needs to be diagnosed. Art is a tool to maybe diagnose, but not yet uh, make a work about that. But I think, Huru, you mentioned that, like the post-communist condition. And Terry Smith, I remember also in an article thinking the contemporary, uh, refers to this geopolitical change around 1990, how that has an impact on the geopolitics of art. And Documenta 11 introduced how to think the, the global condition from the so-called global south in relation to the post-communist condition, but also in relation to the anti-apartheid struggle, to truth and reconciliation, credibility and credibilization, all the platforms. So they were very specifically situated in those debates, political, social, cultural, and how art is able to reflect on that. The reason I'm saying that, could you perhaps say a few words what kind of global ruptures you had in mind, or planetary ruptures, specific ruptures, that informed like thinking historically in the present for the Charger Biennial? I mean, were there specific kind of... Uh, uh, you know, m m movements, or I, 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 haven't, I haven't seen the whole biennial yet. I will study this closely, but I would be very grateful. And maybe could you share how this situates in this political moment of the present regarding what is resonating historically more specifically? But thank you, thank you so much for putting that up and to create that space and to be here. And it feels really like uh, it feels great. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, Audrey. I think, um, well, for me, what I read an article recently that said, uh, what did it say? Something about uh, putting a lot on artists trying to, to, to talk about these issues. But the artists are talking about these issues. I think it's important to spend time in each work. I know there's not enough time for everybody. Uh, <laughs> some works are 30 minutes, some works are 45 minutes, some works are 60 minutes. Um, but this is really about each artist bringing forward their rupture and what they're going through and what they're talking about in their practice, you know. Um, sometimes I've invited artists very early on and some, and for, or I also included photojournalists in the biennial. I've included dancers and choreographers in the biennial. I've included musicians in the biennial because this is something that's not tied to just us in this bubble and there are people on the ground also doing the work. Uh, an example I would say is years ago, I invited Angela Pons to show her photographs of, of uh, what was happening in, in Peru. And now we know the situation that is happening in Peru. You know, Basil, and, uh, Basil Abbas and Ruan Abu Rahma, of course, this is ongoing, but right now what is happening in Palestine. You know, all of these works that, are, that we're showing now um, have resonance with the present. It's not only about looking at the past, but the urgency of what is still happening. Uh, Kimathi Donker's uh, paintings and drawings looking at police violence in, in Britain. You know, I think this is something that is still happening and ongoing. And I think, I don't know if you call them ruptures, I call them like um, reminders maybe, or urgency that these are not things that you can just put aside and, you know, some people would say, oh, these are topics that have been spoken about. And so what? <laughs> we talk about them again and again because they're important to keep talking about because it hasn't been resolved. I don't know if it will be resolved, but it's important that we keep uh, talking about them. But through these shared platforms of solidarities or shared um, common struggles, you create a bigger network of, of coming together. You know, you're stronger together. And I'm hoping that that is obvious or visible. Yeah. <clears throat> thank you, Hur. Thank you, Magda. And thank you, Octavio, again. Um, I think we run out of time, so we'll leave every other discussion to happen face-to-face uh, -face afterwards. Uh, I also want to take a minute to thank uh, the team at the uh, Sharjah Art Foundation for making this happen. Uh, and I also want to thank our colleague at IBA, uh, Jennifer, who is working behind the scenes for this event to be streamed online. Thank you, Jennifer. <laughs>
And uh, I want to remind everyone, of course, to keep in to keep in touch with us uh, and to keep track of our future events at uh, Biennial Association biennialassociation.org or through our uh, social media channels both uh, yeah uh, instagram and, and facebook thank you very much